I am a scientist and I am fascinated by machines. Now these are not the machines that you will see walking down the road or when you go to a workshop. Indeed, these machines have never been conceived, imagined or built by human beings ever. So why should you come here on a Sunday morning to listen about machines which you can't build, which you can't imagine? The reason for that is right now, as I stand here, wave my hands here, as I speak, as you listen to me, there are billions and billions and billions of these machines inside your hands, inside your brain, inside your liver, inside every possible place in your body, working around making you live. What do I mean by that? Now, don't get so worried. These are not machines that were planted inside you by aliens. These are actually your servants. These machines help you do everything that you think you are doing. They take out the trash. They, you know, maybe drop the kids to school sometimes. They cook food for you. Indeed, they do everything that you need to live your daily ordered life. So, what am I talking about? You know, what kinds of machines are these? They are firstly, because I told you that there are billions and billions of them inside you, you need to realize that these are really, really small machines, okay? There are nanoscale machines. We will call them motors from now on, which have been designed and gifted to you by nature to keep you going the way we all see. So, when I you know, show you this slide uh, on the left hand side, what you are actually seeing is a cell, is a cell from your body. And this is where all the action is. This is the unit of life, as you all have read. And inside these cells are these really nanoscale motors or machines, whatever you want to call them, doing their job all the time. And when you see uh, on the left hand side, you will see there was one guy who started these shiny objects, one guy who started from here and went to the extreme end of the cell. Now these shiny objects that you see are one micron in size. They are about a hundred times smaller than the thickness of your hair. And you are looking at this picture because you use a very special microscope to magnify everything and you see it on the screen. So this guy who went very fast and ended up at the end, you can see him, you know, start here right now. You know, think of him as somebody, you know, maybe his boss has asked him to come to work at eight in the morning. So he's overtaking everybody and he has to get somewhere. And this is exactly what happens on, on a busy highway like this. Maybe that red car has a guy who has to reach early and, you know, he will overtake others and get somewhere. So just like on this busy highway, you know, there is an equivalent something going on inside the cells of your body all the time. There's an amazing amount of activity, motion. All of you have heard, what is life without motion? And here is the motion that gives you life, actually. Let me now to explain what I'm talking about, let me be a little more specific. And to do that, we will take the help of this unsuspecting chameleon. And imagine that this chameleon is walking around in the bushes outside your home and, you know, it turns a corner and it spots a cat. It freezes. Now it realizes, look, I'm going to be eaten up, so I need to do something. And what is that something? It needs to change its color. Okay, it needs to hide in the, you know, it needs to realize what is the color of the leaves around it and needs to hide. So how is it going to change colors? This is not going to happen by magic. Okay, there is a physical principle behind this and the physical principle lies in the cells of the chameleon, the cells underneath the skin of that chameleon and there are millions and millions of such uh, uh, cells underlying uh, the skin of the chameleon. Now inside these cells, one such cell is shown here, are these little d black dots, they are actually little balls of ink. Okay, now remember, this is not something unique to the chameleon. I and you also have such cells underneath our skins. And our cells also have these little balls of ink. So now let us go inside these cells and see what happens in the cells. And you know, where is this action that I'm talking about? So for that, we go to the next slide. This is what happens 
in the cell when the chameleon sees the cat. Okay, all these balls of ink, you saw that they, you know, they were at the distributed all over the cell, and in over a period of a few minutes, all of them will come to the center, and that will make the chameleon look lighter in color. Okay, and it can do the reverse thing where it can, you know, send the cells, uh, send these little balls of ink to the periphery of the cells so that it looks darker. This is how the chameleon changes color. But you see, these little balls of ink are not moving on their own. They are being moved by somebody. Somebody is carrying them either towards the outside of the cell or towards the inside so that the chameleon can escape the cat. Who is this? You know, who is doing all this? This you see in this video. There are roads inside cells. You see these roads like these, you know, small hollow tubes. And on these roads, imagine these little balls of ink being carried by these little coolies, okay, which walk around from one place to the other. And they walk fairly fast. They can cover, you know, they can go across the cell in, in a few, you know, minutes. And this is actually what takes these little balls of ink either to the periphery of the cell or inwards. And this is not just little balls of ink. All kinds of processes, all kinds of life processes require some equivalent of this. You know, for, for my heart to beat, I need something like this. Now, let us focus on an individual motor protein or an individual machine. What does it do? It does something like this, which is this. I, when I have to walk, have to push against the ground so that I generate some friction and move myself forward. This is exactly what these motor proteins do. They generate force. And to make things move inside your cells, to make the cells divide, to make the cells deform, to, for you to grow five fingers here. Now, it, this is actually a real motor. It is called the dynein motor. And this is magnified many, many, many times using something called an electron microscope. And you can see, you know, this is one leg of the dynein motor and it works exactly like my leg when I push back like this, okay? Now remember, all this is happening at really, really tiny scales and that is what is necessary for to generate almost every kind of conceivable motion inside your body, okay? So aren't these machines really fascinating? And look at what they do for you. Now, it's not that these uh, machines are, you know, doing what they want to do all the time and everything is uh, nice and happy. This, what you see in this video are mitochondria and all of you know that the mitochondria are the batteries that power you and me, okay? The mitochondria inside your cells are the powerhouse, the battery of all kinds of life that uh, we know and these mitochondria actually move around inside the cells. Why do they move around? Because they have to supply energy to different places inside the cell and if that energy is not supplied where it is needed, your cells are going to die. Now see, these mitochondria were moving around nicely but see what happens when you have a viral infection. The mitochondria are barely moving and they look very different. Now. This is really scary because this is what a virus or a bacteria or a parasite, when it infects you, it can do. Apart from disrupting how mitochondria work and supply energy to different parts of your body, to the different cells, they can disrupt many, many kinds of processes inside, inside your body. You know, it's not that we need these motors to function in a particular way and things can go wrong only when you have a disease. Even in the normal condition, like when I'm speaking here, I'm quite healthy, uh, things are not easy for these motors. Here, what you see in this video is one guy who's merrily pulling something along, and that can be the mitochondria which I showed you, but suddenly the opposite uh, you know, motor will wake up and that other guy wants to you know, pull the thing in the opposite direction. And so there is this tug of war going on all the time inside the cells of your body. And this tug of war is why you, you know, this kind of motion, this kind of friction is why you generate heat inside your body. You know that when you run your engine for too long, car for too long, you must stop because your car engine heats up. You know that your body is at a higher temperature compared to the outside. This is because of all these kinds of life processes going on inside your body which generate heat and friction. So here, 
what you see below is what we were able to show in our laboratory for the first time that such a tug of war the, on the basis of which this animation is made actually happens inside cells. You would have seen when the video ran that you know these there are two particles being pulled across and you know stretched and that is actually these motors stretching these. So uh, no, just step back and think for a while. Here are these little, little creatures which we cannot even design, we cannot build, you know, human beings are unlikely to build something like this for the next 30, 40 years, though there are attempts being made. They keep you going all the time. Now, when I talk about force, you know, this kind of a tug of war happening, you know, these tiny things pulling uh, one against the other, uh, is there a way to measure this force? That is the biggest question. If we can understand how these motors generate force, we can actually in real time measure their activity because their job is to generate force. If I measure that force, I can measure their activity. This is rarely possible in you know, real experiments in biology, but here is a case where we could actually do it. So to, to, to explain what I mean, I. Uh, you know, project the image of this very eminent scientist. I'm sure most of you would know who he is. Do you? Stephen Hawking. Do you know that he also had a very different dream, which has not yet been fulfilled. And his dream was to take a spaceship, which you see here in gray, and project that from Earth to a very distant galaxy, let's say Alpha Centauri here, okay? Now, and he was going to project it using a beam of light, that beam of red light, as you see in this, uh, in this shot. Now, the point here is that using light, you can generate force. You can push, you can pull. Now, if I take a laser pointer and shine it at you, I'm not going to really push you or pull you. You will not even feel it. But imagine something much, much smaller than you, like that mitochondria or that bacteria inside, you know, inside your cells. You can actually push the bacteria or pull the bacteria using laser light. And so this is the celebrated optical trapping, optical tweezer technology, which was you know, brought to reality by this man, Arthur Ashkin, who won the Nobel Prize in physics last year for his discovery of the optical tweezers and how they can be used to understand the machines that I'm talking about, these tiny machines, okay? So what Arthur Ashkin did can be, you know, in a very simple way uh, seen in this video is that, uh, let's say you have a motor protein, those that tiny servant that I talked about in green here, and it is pulling something, let's say a bacteria or a mitochondria or a virus uh, along, and suddenly you shine a focused laser beam in that. Now this laser beam, because it generates a force, it works like a spring. So this motor tries to pull this particle out of the spring, but the spring pulls it back. All of you would have seen, it's not easy to pull a spring too far out, okay? So when that happens, and you can measure the distance by which this motor can pull the spring out, you can measure how strong this motor is, okay? So you can really measure these forces and guess how small these forces are. They are about a million, million times smaller than the kind of forces that I use to toss this up and down. Okay, so they are really, really small forces. But without that, I cannot do this without those forces, right? So there are arrays and arrays of these motors working around all the time to, you know, for us to do everything. They are needed for me to speak, even for the dog to wag its tail, okay? So <clears throat> this is all well and good, but there are many times uh, what we wanted to focus on is how can we use this technology to understand when you know, pathogens attack your body and can we do something to try and prevent that in the future? For that, I show you this picture here. On the left, what you see in that imaginary sphere, imagine it is a bacteria which has infected the immune cells of your body. That is where your immune cells are supposed to protect you from this bacteria because otherwise you cannot survive for too long. What happens on the immune cells is that there are patches of cholesterol. All of you, you know, hate cholesterol, I know, but here is somewhere where cholesterol is doing something very good for you. There is a patch of cholesterol in red at the bottom, which assembles on this bacteria, and the dynein motor, which I showed you earlier, many of them, you know, assemble on that patch of cholesterol. This is what we could find out by our experiments, and when this 
So many motors get together, think of them as a large strong motor which now takes this bacteria to a place inside the cell where it is going to get degraded. Well, this would happen for normal bacteria, but then again there are smart bacteria like the Kala Azar bacteria which causes you know, the disease Kala Azar or Leishmaniasis. This bacteria is smart. What it can do, it can disrupt these platforms of cholesterol so all the motors get dissipated like what you see in the right hand side and then this guy survives and it multiplies and multiplies and it can make your organs burst inside and it can kill you. Okay? So we hope to use these kind of technologies to give, to understand how basic processes of infection and happen so that maybe in the future we can find therapies against them. My lab also tries to understand how these same motors are required for your liver to send out fat into your blood. Now all of you understand that the diseases of this century are the diseases of wealth. They are diseases where you have too much fat, diabetes, obesity. If we can understand by our research how the amount of blood in your amount of fat in your blood is controlled by your liver, then maybe we can you know control this from outside and prevent diseases like obesity and you know all the kind of other maladies, heart attack that you uh, know about. Now think. There are going to be days where you are going to be very down. You are going to be depressed, okay? Nothing seems to be moving and you would like to just sit in a corner and, you know, cover your head with a blanket and, you know, nothing seems to be working. On those days, I would like you to think that while you cower in a corner, you have these guys, millions and millions of them working inside you incessantly to make, keep you going, okay? So don't forget that. Take inspiration from them. Get up, walk again and do what you have to do. I will stop here. Thank you very much.